Thor is currently serving as a scientist uh, emeritus at NASA. Previously, he served as associate director of the Astrophysics Projects Division, as well as the program manager for the physics of the Cosmos program and the Cosmic Origins program at NASA Goddard Space Flight, Space, uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. Mansoor has spent most of his career in serving the Hubble Space Telescope program in different capacities, including the flight operations manager, including as flight operations manager and project manager for HST operations. He's participated in all but one Hubble repair mission. Uh, during a short stint away from Hubble Space Telescope, Mansoor has served as the mission manager for the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, the orbit mission, the, the, the deputy project manager for the James Webb Space Telescope, and as the project manager for the uh, LISA mission, the laser interferometer space antenna mission a collaborative endeavor between NASA and the European Space Agency with the goal to verify Einstein's theory of, gravi uh, Einstein's theory of relativity by detecting gravitational waves generated by massive objects in our universe. Mansoor Saab, commonly known as Mooney, grew up, grew up in Peshawar and studied in PF College, Lower Topa before migrating to the US in 1970. Mansoor has, been, uh, has a BS from the University of Maryland, an MS from George Washington University, both in mechanical engineering. He has received the NASA Group Achievement Award 2001, the Goddard Space Flight Center Group Achievement Award 1995, and the NASA Exceptional Service Medal 1995. Mansoor has been a member of the US government Senior Executive Service in 2007. Another great thing about him besides his scientific endeavors is uh, he loves to direct movies. He has one movie named Bhool and 20 short movies uh, to date. Most of the films have been showcased in local film festivals and two of them have received audience choice awards for best short films. Uh, so we uh, actually, uh, I, I, I met him a few years ago. It was always, always been a pleasure to meet him in every meeting. Uh, and we had the good fortune to actually screen some of his films uh, at NAST a few years ago. Perhaps we can do something similar here as well uh, at some point. But for today, he's going to talk, uh, talk to us about the James Webb Space Telescope. Over to you. Hello, Assalamu Alaikum. How is everybody? So thank you, Rizwan, for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak to the uh, uh, young generation, the future engineers, future scientists, future leaders, not only of Pakistan. Oh, uh, oh so, today's so, topic is James Webb Space Telescope. This is the latest uh, observatory that uh, we have worked on for a very long time. Uh, it was launched on December uh, 25th, Christmas Day. Uh, and uh, it's one of the most proudest uh, moment for NASA after uh, Hubble Space Telescope. So Hubble Space Telescope has you know, produced uh, amazing science. It has also created new, new questions for us. And so James Webb will hopefully be answering some of those questions and maybe even create new questions for us. So um, we'll talk about the scientific goals for James Webb, but also equally proud uh, NASA is for the, the engineering feat that was required to build this telescope uh, <clears throat> so that um, a major, major technolo technological ad advances had to be made uh, to be able to launch this uh, telescope. So uh, what we will talk about uh, in detail is actually shown in a very short video that I would like to share with you. This video will give you a kind of an overview of what James Webb is all about, what science is going to do, but also what engineering challenges that it had created that uh, kept the engineers and the scientists, you know, biting nails uh, during the launch. And so 
let's go through that first, and then uh, we'll talk about each and every one of those uh, topics, and it's not advancing. So this is not working. No. Advanced or the screen. Okay, sir. I just play the video. No, there's no audio now. Oh, sector. Speaker concept just for the BX. Yeah. Let's see now. Yep. We are to Ari either. No, ask for the Hunter Ari. Hm, Tanme, American. Tanme, audio <clears throat>
Okay. Hello, yes. All right. Rosan sir, how much time do we have so I can make sure I finish on time? Two thirty to hoge unless we do time travel, we are past that. Kitne di? Okay, perfect, excellent. <clears throat> so, um, so, uh, but the first question is why to have telescopes to in space to begin with? I mean, we can build as big a telescope you want in on the ground. So, what's the advantage of going to space? And then we've had Hubble already. It's been thirty some years. Hubble is doing great science. So what are the limitations of Hubble that James Webb will need to cover? And then we'll talk about what are the main goals, main scientific objectives for James Webb. And because of those objectives, what engineering requirements have been imposed in the design and construction of the telescope, which has created <clears throat> uh, major te uh, technological challenges and engineering challenges that you saw uh, in the presentation. Uh, and, and then we'll go from there. So what are the uh, main questions in astrophysics today? I guess I have to, the mouse doesn't work, right? So I have to go. Question is how does the universe work? If I'm here, I guess I'm out of the camera. <clears throat> so what's the physics behind the universe? How do the black holes work? What role do they play in the evolution of galaxies? How are the galaxies form and so on? Moses, if I maybe ask you to sit here and advance the slides uh, because it requires uh, the cursor. Yes, Kursi, hi, Yampe. Next slide. Uh, how did the universe evolve from the Big Bang to what it looks like today? Today's astronomers, when you look at the universe, it looks very clumpy, it's very chunky. Things are gathered together. Uh, like in, in within galaxies. And even if you study galaxies in detail, we have star clusters and then you have wide open spaces. Then when you zoom back a little bit, you can see the galaxies are clustered together in uh, neighborhoods. And then we have huge spaces in between. So why is it so chunky? Whereas when the Big Bang occurred, you could expect that everything is everywhere all uniformly. So what has happened in the last 13 and a half billion years that has caused the universe to look like this. Next slide, sir. Where do we come from? We are made out of very heavy <clears throat> atoms, elements. Uh, we, we have carbon, we, we need iron, we breathe oxygen. All of those are atoms that have multiple protons in the nucleus. But in the early universe, you can imagine uh, right after Big Bang, even the, the Elementary particles probably existed for a few seconds and then they created a, uh, a nucleus in the proton with a single proton in this nucleus. And to make the next element, you need to somehow infuse another proton into the nucleus. And to do that, it needs a lot of energy to push protons together into the nucleus. So how, what process took place that created the elements that are uh, the cause of us to exist today? Next slide. And I think this is probably the most interesting, even uh, uh, no matter how small a child is, um, the moment he starts to think, he probably ponders, are we the only one living beings in this entire huge universe? Or are there other civilizations, other beings uh, elsewhere in the universe? And so how do we look for them? How do we find them? And then the last 10 years or so, the biggest mystery after Hubble was launched, uh, the new mysteries were discovered and that is what is dark matter and what's dark energy. We have evidence of some of this, something that's existing out in the universe, uh, but we don't know what that is. So uh, like I said, you know, why put telescopes in space? Uh, one of the reasons is our atmosphere. If you're looking into deep, deep space, the objects are very, very far away and therefore they're very, very faint. And if you've done photography in the dark area, you know that you, the way to get a picture out of a dark image is that you open up your aperture as much as you can. The bigger the aperture, more light it will collect. Then you don't move anything, you stay very stable. 
and let the light collect over a number of minutes. Uh, and then you will get a, enough light to create an image. So the problem with our atmosphere is it's, it's not stable. Its density varies because of the temperature variations as you go up and down. And what that does is makes the, the light from the stars actually move. So no matter how big the aperture is, your image is not gonna be stable. And so you won't be able to uh, capture that light as efficiently as if the atmosphere wasn't there. So that's one reason to have a telescopes observatories above the atmosphere. The second concern is that <clears throat> the human vision is limited to just the visible light, the uh, what we call the visible band. It's a very tiny fraction of the entire electromagnetic spectrum that is available to us in the universe. The, the objects in the universe emit uh, information in the whole range of uh, wavelengths all the way from long radio waves all the way to short wavelength gamma rays. And some of them are very dangerous. And we are happy that our atmosphere is there because it absorbs and doesn't let those wavelengths come through. And so it's good for us, but it's not good for science because now we don't have access to that information. So that's another reason why we would launch a, an observatory above the atmosphere. So we have access to a much bigger uh, breadth of information. And so this is an example of some of the observatories that have been launched or being worked on uh, that are optimized for various different wavelength regime so that we have a bigger picture, a complete picture of uh, looking at the universe. The visible light, as you can see, is a very tiny fraction of that spectrum. And Hubble Space Telescope is optimized in the visible uh, band of uh, uh, electromagnetic spectrum with a very tiny capability in the UV and a very tiny capability in the near infrared. And so that's what Hubble is capable of. Next slide. Now, why uh, study deep objects? My, one of the question was, how does the universe evolve from, from what it used to be into what it looks like today? And to do that, we need to be able to travel in the past and see how the universe was. Uh, in the in the past, in the earlier days, and maybe all the way back to the Big Bang. But how do we do that? <clears throat> we do that because the light travels at a finite speed, even though <clears throat> it's very, very fast, but it still has a finite speed compared to the vast distances that we have uh, in the universe. So for example, uh, the moonlight takes 1.3 seconds to reach us, which means that when you're looking at the moon, you're looking at the history of the moon 1.3 seconds ago. It's not there right now. It was there 1.3 seconds ago. The sun, on the other hand, is eight minutes away. Same thing, when you look at the sun, it's really not there right now. It was there eight minutes ago. Neptune is the farthest planet. Its light takes uh, four hours to get to us. So the deeper you look, the farther in the past. If you take an image of Neptune, it tells you what it would look like four hours ago. It may have disappeared. Uh, in the meanwhile, but we won't know that until after four hours. So if we can look at deeper and deeper objects in space, which means fainter and fainter objects in space, that means we're looking at a snapshot of an older uh, time in the universe. So the farther we can look, the earlier time in the life of universe we can image. And so by doing taking these slices of time, uh, across the, uh, the universe, we get to understand how the universe has evolved, how the galaxies have evolved and so forth. So this is a very famous image of uh, <clears throat> Hubble. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, where we pointed Hubble at a very tiny portion of the sky where we didn't think anything existed. It was all dark. And so we took the risk of spending 11 days just staring at the dark spot to see what happens. We opened up the aperture fully. And uh, as a result, I'll go back to that picture. This image evolved. And, and in the tiny piece of the sky, each and every one dot is uh, not a star, but it's a galaxy by itself, which has trillions and trillions of stars in it. <clears throat> and so next slide. When you look at the, these galaxies, you can see differences in colors, and which indicates some of them are uh, younger galaxies closer by, some of them are older galaxies much farther away. Next slide. 
And so if we could look deeper and deeper, we'll get to know more and more information about uh, the universe. Next slide. But it so happens is that Hubble's image uh, vision is limited. Some of the lights from the earlier, earlier galaxies have not reached Hubble. Hubble has not been able to see them. And next slide. <clears throat> the reason for that is the Doppler effect. Again, I'm sure you all, all have studied uh, Doppler. If you haven't, it's very simple. If you're standing on a train station and a train is coming towards you, uh, the, the wavelength of sound coming to you is getting compressed because the train is approaching you closer and closer. And so the, <clears throat> you, see a very, you feel a very high pitch because the wavelengths are being compressed into shorter wavelength. And as the train goes by, so the pitch goes higher, uh, deeper, lower, because the wavelengths getting stretched and stretched and stretched. The same thing's happening in the universe. After Big Bang, we know that the universe is expanding, which means that everything is moving away from us. So the older the galaxies, the far, means that they gain more, more acceleration and they're going even faster and faster from us. So yeah, let me uh, tell you when to change. <clears throat> So um, what's happening is even though the old galaxies that are distant, far away, are emitting their light, they have a visible light uh, uh, portion in their spectrum. But by the time that light comes to Earth, it's turned into infrared. And so we cannot see that light with the Hubble's capability. The other uh, issue is that, uh, what's the next slide there? And so if you could see the infrared red light somehow, uh, we would be able to see deeper than uh, Hubble Space Telescope. The other issue with studying the universe is the understanding the, the deaths and the, the birth of new stars. When a star dies, it expels its matter that it's created in the fusion, which is you know, from hydrogen to the next element into space. It creates a huge cloud of dust in that dust are where the new stars of the next generations are born. And uh, the dust absorbs mostly the visible light. And so the visible light doesn't really penetrate through that dust. So even the objects that are close by, Hubble has difficulty penetrating through <clears throat> the dust cloud. And so an infrared uh, capability would be useful even in studying uh, nearby uh, star formation, even within our own galaxies. Thirdly, again, looking for life, we will talk about it in a minute, but the, uh, <clears throat> the way to look for life is remotely. And we have to study uh, objects in space to see if there is any evidence of life, uh, life. And it so happens is that the more powerful uh, signature of a, a life that might exist is in infrared as well. So that's another reason why an infrared telescope would be useful. Next slide. So this is the picture, same picture, one in the visible light, one in infrared. And you can see that infrared light, we can see through uh, the, the opaque uh, object that we have. Next slide. So this is a, another image of uh, Hubble. It's uh, again, a dust cloud that has been created since a, a, an old star has died and it expelled this material into space. And what we can observe is around the cloud, we can see some kind of glow everywhere. So they, either is there something shining behind it or something shining inside it. So with the limited infrared capability of Hubble, we then took the same picture with the infrared camera. Next slide. And now you can peer through that dust and you can see that hundreds of new stars are being born inside uh, that uh, cloud of dust. So those are the reasons why we needed <clears throat> an observatory equally or even more powerful than Hubble, but optimized in infrared light. So this is what we know so far about our universe. <clears throat> At time zero, we had a big bang every, and then within a few seconds, the universe expanded uh, and created the, and because of the big bang and it's in expansion, it cooled down. And even though we had atoms like hydrogen, but there were only atoms. They did not collide together to create light. So for 400 million years, the universe was dark. It did not have any energy source to produce light. 
to come to us. So as the hydrogen atoms started to combine together to make a bigger mass, the mass, mass got more gravity, it attracted more mass until a point where it became so big that the gravitational forces acting in the center of that star were so powerful that it started to fuse the hydrogen atoms together, created a fusion reaction and started to burn. And that's when the first uh, stars were born. And we hope uh, that uh, James Webb be able to uh, observe that particular phenomenon because that light is coming to us in infrared. We also, uh, so this is an image of the James Webb and hopefully we can see as far as where the dark ages end. Uh, next slide. So these are some of the science goals uh, for James Webb. Uh, observe the end of the dark ages because again, if, if there's no light, even James Webb cannot see beyond that. Then it can start uh, studying the evol evolution of galaxies. What do the young galaxies uh, look like and what do they look like today? And uh, our beliefs is that the early galaxies were small and they started to collide together and started to become bigger and bigger galaxies. And so they look like what they look like today. Also, James Webb will look at the burst of stars within the dust uh, clouds of uh, <clears throat> other stars and see how the stars are created and then how the, the disk, the debris that's left behind that stars not using become planets just like our solar system. And then we'll be able to look at planets nearby if there are any to see if there are any origins of light because even that sig signatures are in infrared light. So let, let's go to the video if we can. Next slide, next slide. So this video kind of shows you a basic uh, theoretical Theoretically, what happened? <clears throat> the places where stars and planets are born from among the galaxies is a beautiful locale. These cosmic landscapes change as new generations of stars light up and disperse the Earth cloud. But the youngest stars seen here are already perhaps 10 million years old. Are they hot close? Stars and planets form in the dark, inside vast cold clouds of gas and dust, such as these pillars imaged by the Hubble Space Telescope. The dust is so thick, we can't see the inland stars inside, at least not with visible light. With infrared light, Hubble can see through all but the thickest dust. Yet, it's in those dense knots that the young stars are forming. And to peer inside them, astronomers need the James Webb Space Telescope. <laughs> With a mirror larger than Hubble and performance optimized for the infrared, Webb will give astronomers their closest look yet at stellar Earth. We're flying through the computer model that represents astronomers' best ideas about the star formation process. Reddish colors indicate thicker dust, but temperature less than 400 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Or less than 240 degrees below zero Celsius. Back in the well ahead is a protostar, perhaps 10,000 years old. Protostars arise when the dense knot of dust less than a light year across collapses. But the details of the process are not well known. Elsewhere in the cloud, another protostar is preparing to build a planet. As the cloud that created the protostar collapsed, it flattened into a disk. This we see here is 600 times the size of the pencil around the sun. <clears throat> if placed in our solar system, it will extend far beyond the planet. In this computer model, this continues to accumulate gas and dust on its surroundings for thousands of years. Eventually, the disk fragments into a dense white structure. These may become sites for giant planets. Later, during another phase of construction, smaller Earth sized planets may take shape. At least, that's what scientists do happen. It will take the red telescopes and you can go to the next one. See what's really going on in the old part of the stellar space. 
So once the planets are born, uh, we can actually study some of those planets and their atmospheres to, <clears throat> to do spectroscopy and see what those planets are made of and are there any uh, signatures uh, of a biological activity in those planets. So next video, if you can go to the next slide, next slide. If you play that, it kind of explains what the planetary science James Weiss going to do. <clears throat> Planets begin as dense mountains, cloudy, gas, and dust swirling around a young star. But how do they go from something like this to something like this? With the James Webb Space Telescope, astronomers will be able to study how planets come to be and how they change as they get older. After centuries of searching, astronomers are finding exoplanets just about everywhere. Ranging from giant planets with masses much greater than Jupiter to worlds only a few times more massive than Earth. But where do the planets we know best fit into the imaginary world astronomers are finding? And how do our solar system come to be the way it is? Why is Earth a balmy, water rich world? And are there other stars that help in the galaxy? These are the kinds of questions astronomers will address through the best. For planets that pass directly in front of their stars, Webb is such a chemical finger on it, identifying atmospheric gases like water gas, carbon dioxide, and methane that absorbs the wavelength of the star's light. Webb will mm -hmm. also study the best pieces. Where new plants form to reveal how the chemical compositions of younger and older change with time and identify how these changes are reflected in the planets we find. Such studies will be revolutionary in their own way, and by applying Webb's capabilities closer to home, astronomers will better understand the planetary. You can go to the next one. <laughs> so, uh, James Webb will study not just these exoplanets which are around other stars, but also objects that we believe have water within our own solar system. <clears throat> so these are some of the uh, four uh, in instruments or cameras <clears throat> James Webb have, has three of them are optimized for, uh, for, for near infrared 0.8 to uh, five microns, and then one min mid infrared camera is optimized for from 5 to 28 microns. So we have a huge range of uh, bandwidth that the James Webb will be able to study. Uh, next slide. Uh, the near cam, which is going to be the primary workforce, um, just like the wide field camera on Hubble, will be the one that will be creating all the beautiful pictures that we see and be able to see all uh, kinds of things. It also has a coronagraph. Again, the coronagraph uh, is there to study uh, to, or to to actually image planets. Just a few uh, minutes to spend on that. It's an important concept. To be able to detect a planet which is going around its star at the distance similar to our Earth from a star, the two objects are very, very close together. And the contrast of how much light they emit is almost 10 billion. So just imagine a firefly sitting next to or flying next to a big searchlight uh, on the beach. As long as the searchlight is off, you can probably see the firefly, but if the searchlight comes on, it will wash out any uh, light that's coming from the planet. So we need technology to be able to block the starlight and let the image of the planet emerge. And so this, uh, this camera will hopefully be able to uh, do some of that science. Um, Next uh, 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 camera is more of a spectrograph. And most of the science is really done by spectroscopy. Um, as you heard before, uh, atoms, molecules that may exist in the universe do absorb certain wavelengths of light. Uh, if somebody was to study Earth as the sunlight, our sunlight crosses through our atmosphere and maybe somebody out there is capturing that 
uh, sunlight and doing a spectroscopy on it, they will be able to clearly see the signatures of water vapor, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and methane, and they will say, okay, there's some biological activity going on. So uh, we need to do spectroscopy on objects, it, uh, not just the planet, but even looking at the galaxies, we can tell how big the galaxy is, what's the major uh, elements that are inside and so forth. But again, to do a spectroscopy on a very, very faint object, you need to be able to stare on that object for a very, very long time. And on the image plane of, of James Webb, once you take a picture, you see hundreds of uh, images at the same time. And if you were to do spectroscopy one at a time for each of those uh, images, it'll take uh, hundreds of hours to actually do the science of just that one image. So NearSpec has another new technology that we worked on, uh, it's called micro shutters, and that's the micro, uh, micro electromechanic machines, the MEMS uh, devices, which are very, very, very tiny. You have to look through a, a microscope to actually see them. And so with that MEMS device, we can actually command which image should have a slit open in front of it to create a spectrum. So this uh, instrument can take spectra of about 100 images all at the same time. So hopefully that'll speed up the time uh, that James Webb will need to complete its uh, science goals. The other ones are, again, uh, more for longer wavelength. And so we'll be able to do much more fainter objects. Uh, and the next one is just mostly backing up these other instruments but also help guide the telescope once it's reached its uh, target then to stay stable on that target you need some kind of guiding system to keep the telescope pointing to your target <clears throat> next slide uh, next slide so that's the scientific aspects of this scientific aspirations of what we need to do with james webb but what does that mean engineering wise what's the problem that we had to face to, to be able to build this machine. There are basically three aspects of James Webb that are really creating this uh, uh, engineering challenges for us. First of all is the size of the mirror. If you want to look deeper and deeper into the universe, you need bigger and bigger mirrors, bigger and bigger lenses, bigger and bigger aperture that can collect more light. Secondly, if you are a cryogenic, if you're an infrared telescope, if you're imaging something in infrared, then everything that exists that has any temperature at all is actually generating infrared light. I'm emitting infrared signals. You guys are emitting infrared signals. And if the telescope is at uh, room temperature, let's say even at uh, 20 degrees or whatever, it will emit infrared light. And so if you're taking an image, you don't know whether that light is coming from a distant star or is it being generated by the telescope. So to create the, to reduce the noise factor, <clears throat> we need to eliminate any uh, infrared light that the telescope might generate. So that's why it needs to have as low a temperature as possible so that any noise coming from the telescope itself is almost minimum. So that's why the telescope has to be cool to minus 220 degrees or so uh, centigrade. <clears throat> now, uh, I mean, stay back. back. <clears throat> so to do that, you know, we have figured out how you do that. We can, you know, astro astronomers said that we need at least six and a half meter diameter. Okay, we will build you one. Uh, we can build thermal shields and whatnot to protect, to try to pull the telescope. But how do we launch something this big? Uh, the diameter is six and a half meters. The biggest rocket we have so far is only five meters. So how do you fit a 20, bar, 20 pound stuff into a 10 pound bag? So that's combined with all those three things is where the engineering issues have come about. So next slide is a primary mirror. <clears throat> six and a half meters, several times bigger than James Webb. We can go to the next slide. This is a comparison between a human being, the, Hubble mirror and then the James Webb mirror. So Hubble mirror is a very a solid one single piece of glass polished to the right prescription and so forth. And it is very, very thick so that it, it can withstand launch and doesn't di uh, distort you know, due to thermal environments of space and whatnot. And so it is very, very heavy. So one approach is to take the same technology and build a six and a half meter 
uh, mirror. Uh, number one, it'll be so heavy that we probably won't have enough fuel to actually launch it out of the Earth's gravity. <clears throat> and secondly, how does it fit into a rocket that's only five, five and a half meters? So uh, that drove us to coming up with a, a, a segmented mirror design. So what that is, is there are about 18 small mirrors, all hexagon, uh, that are placed in a frame that can be folded so that once it's unfolded, those 18 segments act like a single mirror. And we'll talk more about how do we create a single mirror out of 18 mirrors. But also each and every one of them is very, very thin uh, uh, so that we can actually move them around after launch in case they have shifted to adjust uh, uh, the prescription. But then to do that, to make them light, we have to find a material that is light enough and strong enough to withstand the vibrations of launch uh, and, and the thermal uh, environments of space, and yet uh, give us the right prescription. So beryllium was the choice. And so this mirror is almost no more heavier than the Hubble Space Telescope mirror. Next slide. So that's the, uh, the logic, the trade studies we went through for uh, the large aperture mirror, do we do, do a monolith mirror or do we segmented mirror? And if you do a segmented mirror, which has to be light, which means that most likely it won't stay in its place uh, after launch and then with folding and unfolding, things will move. So that means each and every segment has to be adjustable. So that was a design driver. And the whole thing has to be foldable so that it can fit into uh, the rocket. How do we cool this temperature? You know, it, when it's launched, it's at maybe uh, 20, 21 degrees or so room temperature on Earth, but we need to go 200 or so degrees colder. So again, two options, we can add cooling systems on it, you know, air conditioning or cryo cooling and whatnot, but to cool such a huge uh, telescope would require equally heavy equipment, which require equally more fuel to, to, uh, to launch it and then if the, uh, the cooling system runs out of its own uh, refrigerant, then you're end of uh, science mission. So we decided to use the space, which is a much, much cold temperature, four degrees Kelvin, and is a natural heat sink that uh, we can radiate the, th the thermal energy into space to cool uh, the telescope. But to, to reach the temperatures, that means we need to protect any heat coming from any other sources, like the sun, the moon, and the earth from hitting the telescope. So that drove us into a sun shield, which by the size of the mirror to protect ends up to be a big, as big as a tennis size of the tennis court. Again, how do you fit that in a rocket? So that has to be foldable and deployable. So all of those challenges drove us into the new technologies uh, that we had to come up with to build this telescope. Next slide. So this is what the telescope looks like when it's fully deployed. You can see the, the optic, optical telescope above the, the thermal shields behind and the sun is always coming from this side. So these shields will protect the heat uh, of the sun. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But this is what it looks like when it's functioning. But next slide. This is a, a picture of the, the full actual mirror when it's fully deployed and being tested. You can see how big it is compared to the human beings. Uh, next slide. And to, to, uh, we can't just build it and launch it. We have to test it to make sure that it actually will survive the environments and it actually has a prescription that we think it has. So we need huge chambers uh, to, to do the testing, which also we didn't have. Uh, fortunately, uh, many, many years ago, we did have an Apollo program uh, which needed these big chambers to study the Apollo uh, launching systems and whatnot. So we adopted these big chambers to our needs and created chambers that this, this big uh, observatory could be tested. So this is a fully deployed mirror, at least some segments of it, the center part. And then this is what it looks like when it's folded up. <clears throat> now, how do we, after launch, if things have moved, how do we um, create one single mirror out of the 18 uh, segments of the mirror? So that's yet another technology we had to 
work on it's called the wave sense, wavefront sensing and control. So if we can figure out what each and every segment is doing, is it in focus or not in focus? If it's not, we can move that segment around so that it becomes in focus. And so that process of what do we look for? What do we study? How do we figure out what the, um, the error is and how do we fix the error is called the wavefront sensing and control. So next slide. Each and every one of those 18 segments has actuators in the back of them. These actuators can actually move the mirrors laterally. Uh, each step could be as small as one ten thousandth of a size of a human here. And so we can, we can do very fine adjustments, but also has mechanism in the center so that we can actually change the curvature of each and every segment if need to be. So next slide, uh, next slide. This is actually a video that will really show you what has to happen <clears throat> to form single mirror out of 18 segments. <clears throat> So basically the telescope takes an image of a star and if each and every segment is not properly focused, you will get 18 different images of that star. And then you figure out how much you need to move that one segment to bring that image up from that uh, segment into focus. And we repeat that for all 18 segments. <clears throat> Okay. So uh, again, the building each and every one of the segments by itself is a huge engineering feat. This uh, slide shows how many steps each and every segment has to go through to be able to be created and put on the space. The next uh, movie also gives you an idea of that. Okay, so now let's talk about the temperature. What are the issues with the cooling it? So all we need to do is protect the telescope from the sunlight and maybe a little bit of energy that's coming from the moon. The concept is very simple. Uh, next slide. From a design perspective, there is no atmosphere out in space, so there's no convection to worry about. 
the things are not touching each other. So there's no conduction to worry about. So all you need to do is worry about the radiation. And the way you do that is you create a number of shields that are isolated from each other. The very first shield reflects most of the sunlight away from it, but it does absorb some, so it gets hot. It then radiates some uh, infrared uh, thermal energy to the next shield and the process continues. And so by the time you get to the last shield, very, very tiny amount of heat from the sun, maybe in microwatts level actually comes through and which is good enough for us to be able to use the space environment to cool it. The problem is the size, next slide, and how to actually uh, uh, unfold this shield. So this gives you an idea of how many hundreds of people are needed to unfold this uh, observatory. <clears throat> So hopefully that gives you an idea. This is how much it take effort and time it takes to really pull these shields out uh, when you're testing it. But all of that has to happen by itself, automatically by the pulleys and chains and uh, spring systems and whatnot on orbit. And you can imagine if any single thing goes wrong, this sun shield will get stuck. You won't be able to cool the telescope and then you will have no science. So I can say fortunately that none of that has happened. All of the engineering that we have done and all the backup systems that we have put together have worked. Uh, next slide. This is what the, the, the telescope looks like inside the Ariane 5 rocket. Uh, you can see how much unfolded it is versus what it looks like uh, when it's fully deployed. Next slide. The other thing is the Lagrange point, which is the stable point between the Earth's sun system that has almost uh, zero gravity. The gravity of the Earth and the sun have been uh, canceling each other out. So that's a very stable point where if we can uh, send an observatory where it can orbit around that point with very little fuel needed to maintain its orbit. So the next slide kind of shows you visually what that orbit looks like. So as the Earth moves around the sun, so, so does that Lagrange point, and so does James Webb, and it keeps orbiting around the Lagrange point. And you can see in this version that the sun shield is always facing the sun, so it's always protecting uh, the telescope, and the telescope is looking away from the sun. But as the Earth goes around in a, in a year, the telescope has the view to the entire universe, so it can really map out anywhere in the universe that you want to see. So like I said, we are fortunate that the James Webb is now reached its destination. All the telescope mirrors have been deployed successfully. The sun shield has come out successfully without any issue. Uh, next slide. And right now we're going through the process of changing, you know, making the 18 individual um, segments into one single uh, mirror and also testing out the instruments, cooling them down and calibrating them. So hope that with together with Jim, uh, with Hubble, which is also out there, uh, visible light and infrared light will give us a much bigger uh, window to the universe. And hopefully it will answer some of the questions and we're pretty sure that it will actually create even more questions that you guys, when you grow up, will have to tackle. So I think that's the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, before that, I think we will pass this out to you guys. Each and every link that you see here has some kind of information, hands-on projects that you, you guys can download if you're interested. I'm sure Bilal will want to do all of them. Uh, you know, download the, uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the James Webb model that you can download and actually build the James Webb. There's a flip book of pictures that you can create and then create a little movie and so on, some other uh, information about James Webb that if you're interested. 
So thank you again for your attention. Oh, I... So while, while we ask any questions, this is actually a step-by-step -step process James Webb has gone through in actually deploying all of the mechanisms. So you can, you can turn the uh, volume down. Let's make it zero. The speaker sound and the speaker again. Here we go. All right. It is one to take it off. Please go ahead. Gotcha. So the question is, why does it need to orbit around Lagrange point and why not just stay? When the James Webb is launched, it is at a very high speed. So when it reaches there, there is nothing to stop it. So you will need a lot more energy to actually stop it uh, to stay there. Again, you know, spinning things are more stable than steady things. So that's why every satellite you have is orbiting something or the other. That's right. Go behind. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, so the, there are two questions. One is, uh, as you probably noticed, each and every segment is of a particular shape, a hexagon shape. Question is why that shape, why not circular? Uh, and let me answer that first. So again, it has to do with geometry and the efficiency of fitting things in a particular area. And the hexagon uh, is perfect because each and every side now be connected to the next side. If they were all circular, there would be huge gaps in between. And so we're wasting a lot of real estate, which could be used for actually uh, being part of the mirror. So uh, hexagon was a perfect choice, a very good question uh, to build this mirror. The second question is, uh, what's the protocol if we do indeed detect um, a, a life form? So I'm not sure uh, what you mean by protocol. I guess I'm assuming, are we gonna go and attack them or are we gonna uh, be friends with them. Is that what you mean by the protocol? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, again, it's the other way around. First, we need to find a planet. Then you have to find life. And if we do find life, I think it's a huge, huge um, uh, uh, phenomena. I mean, most pronounced, pronounced, uh, the profound answer that we will get that we are not alone. But as far as what we do, that information, I'm not sure. I think we will uh, get there when we get there. But I'm sure that it's not something that you know you can keep you know secret to yourself because there's no need to. Everybody all the civilized nations are actually interested in that answer. So the protocol will be that it will be, I'm sure whoever discovers this will be the first one to announce because they probably want the Nobel Prize from it. I'm assuming that there's some sort of radiation from before the late dark ages and, you know, somewhere before that. So why is the James Webb Space Telescope bounded to the late dark ages? 
good exercise. <laughs> yes, after the lunch we had. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so James Webb is not to detect that early signature. That's already been detected by WMAP and COBE and whatnot. And the, the first image you see is the cosmic background uh, radiation energy. So, but that's the signature of the Big Bang. But then there's dark ages. And then we have the first light. So the James Webb is really focused on what happens after the dark ages. Even James Webb won't be able to penetrate through what happens before that. And there are other uh, ways we can do that. We can, we can talk about it if we have time. Okay, who wants the next question? Okay, go ahead. Thank you so much. For that very insightful talk. Uh, my question is a two part question. Um, the first is an engineering question. The second one is a policy question. So uh, the first engineering question, uh, why are the mirror segments the size that they are? Why aren't they smaller or larger? And the second part is, uh, how does the success of the James Webb Space Telescope inform policy for future bigger uh, space observatories? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Again, the answer is the same for the first one. It is the efficiency of the geometry. I mean, uh, we could easily build a one meter mirrors as compared to a two meter hexagon. We could have had two meter, but then the question is where do we put the fold you know, for it to be fold? So it's an engineering trade that we went back and forth. What if this size, what if that size, what if nine segments versus 18? Segments? So it's an engineering trade that you have to go through and you come up with the most efficient uh, answer before you start building it. So all of that happens in what we call a pre-phase A, the architect architectural conceptual design phases, preliminary design phases and so forth. So again, it's an engineering process that led us to uh, that particular answer. So policy question is 